are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuele Tini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. Welcome to another episode. Today, we are going to discuss an important topic. We have touched it before, but now we are going to do it with a change maker, somebody that is together a social entrepreneur, somebody is working at the UN for women empowerment and also a change maker in many enterprises and set up and with government agency. So we are doing this with Fiza Faram. Thank you so much, Fiza, for being here and discussing this important topic with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. It's a pleasure to be here. Fiza, your CV is outstanding. 30 under 30 list with Forbes. So you are on the high level panel for women and economic empowerment of the UN. You are being advising ministries, government agency, and you are really at the forefront of women empowerment. But before that, and going deeper in your work, the, our question, how you have become a change maker in the sustainability space, which is your background? Samuel, by being a woman myself, I think, um, and being a woman who is who found herself to be in a very male-dominated ecosystem, when I started my work, that's exactly when I realized that you know, it, uh, it it takes a lot more for a woman to make her mark than a man needs to perform. My first job was to be the CEO of two companies that I've co-founded uh, with a private family business here in Pakistan. And I realized that you know there there is a lot more that I need to do beyond my age and my gender to prove myself as a competent professional. And I think that burning desire there just not only made me as a, you know the professional who I am today, but also enabled me to work for other women, not just in Pakistan, but globally. Because I realized that, you know, as I grew in my career, when I earlier, I used to be the only woman in a room. If now I'm the only woman on a table, then I owe it to the rest of the women out there to open the doors for them and make their journey easier. So I think that just kind of led me to becoming this change maker and trying to work on all aspects of changing lives of women, of young girls, um, you know, and really creating impact and stories of impact. So I think it was just a very natural evolution towards who I am today. Thank you so much, Fiza. I think your story and the work from the emerging markets and really you see how you have been from your personal story, you have developed your strong passion and the work that what you are doing now in your strong mission. I want to go deeper a bit in the problem, the problem of women and power. We are discussing now is becoming the hot topic and more and more women, luckily, are becoming CEO and are at the helm of company. But still, we have issues. What is the situation? And especially in the emerging world, the one you represent as well. What is the situation? Well, Samuel, the, the issue of empowerment of women, not just in Pakistan, but globally, is a very complex one. There are lots of complex things that lead to the status of women where they are now. They are economic, they are social, they are political, they are cultural. You know, there are lots of barriers that women face in different regions of the world. For me, even before I became a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Women's Economic Empowerment, the top problem or the top solution was always economic empowerment. And I strongly feel that when a woman is economically empowered, um, she automatically ends up having emotional empowerment, social empowerment, legal empowerment, political empowerment. For me, always, I just, I'm sure you, under, you also will agree, in various cultures of the world, when a woman brings bread to the table when a woman is economically empowered that's when you know she's just automatically socially empowered and somebody important in the family in the household in the community and i learned this not just through my own example but also by seeing so many other women around in different sectors be it the rural woman who's working in the field to the urban woman who is working in the corporate sector um to you know it's it speaks for everybody across the board and that's why even when I was a CEO of Baksh Foundation and Baksh Energy, my two entities, I started working on economic empowerment of women. So going to uh, rural villages, going to uh, underprivileged communities and seeing how can we create women as the change, economic agents of change in the community. 
So creating social enterprise out of women in the communities, creating energy entrepreneurs for villages which did not have access to electricity. The solution for me was always in the economic empowerment. And then following the same, when I became an advisor to the UN Secretary General and a member of his high-level panel on women's economic empowerment, even then, it was established that at the top of the Maslow hierarchy of empowerment for a woman comes economic empowerment. And, um, you know, even for private sector, for companies, it's a business case now. It's an economic case now. Uh, businesses that have more women in their senior positions, in their boards, outperform businesses that do not by about 26%. So it's like a pure economic decision. It's a pure economic case. Um, it's not just a feminist is issue and a social issue anymore, but it's a pure economic decision. And that's what we learned from our various experiences. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I, as I grew further in my, in my career trajectory, I became clear and clear that economic empowerment is what we all need to focus on. It is actually even in line with my experience here in Kenya and the work that I've done many years in the development, really, when a woman brings the, as you said very clearly, brings the bread on the table, automatically social empowerment, she has voice. If you don't bring bread on the table, that is where, you know, uh, the turning point, where the wheel can spin in the other direction. And you have mentioned really the work that you are doing at the global level, even, you know, at the highest with the, with the UN Secretary General and his panel. Can you give us some impact stories from your work that you are doing and how you are really changing, trying to change with this, this difficult situation. For the woman that we worked with in our foundation, uh, you know, when you go to a village that has no access to electricity and then you set up a business, uh, you set up a solar energy charging station and then you train a woman from the community to run that charging station and become the energy entrepreneur of that village, you're actually empowering not only the entire community, the woman, but the, the future of that village, like when we would go into these villages, we would see a village with absolutely no light, pitch dark, you know, blackout. And when we would have done our work in the village and we're leaving, uh, we would actually see like those solar lanterns bling in every household. You know, uh, farmers going out at night carrying the solar lanterns, kids playing in the light of the solar lanterns. And you realize how these small things have such huge dividends for the rural economies, right? And this is just one example. Lots and lots of projects I've done, like, you know, my, my projects on gender mainstreaming and wildlife ecotourism. You go and you meet those communities in the northern parts of Pakistan where, you know, they've never had access to the cities. They've never had access to formal conversations. And there also, when you, when you create economic opportunities for the woman, in the ecosystem of tourism, for example, which was the project, it's, it's just delightful because you can actually see that these women have all the potential, but they were just never presented with an opportunity to translate that potential into an economic dividend. And this applies across the across the board. So like my project with the private sector, Male Champions of Change, it is actually enabling private sector CEOs to step up for women empowerment and gender equality. It is actually enabling numbers to go up. And we are seeing those numbers progress every quarter when we do a stock take. And then it's just, you know, when you look at the larger impact, when you're going to be empowering 50% of your population, you're and that too by empowering women, you're not only empowering the woman of the household, but you're empowering the future generations. Because I that I learned from my own example too. It is the mother the children learn from, right? So you're setting examples, you're setting trends. You're creating agents of change. I love that philosophy because I truly and honestly believe that there is no way countries and this world can progress by neglecting 50% of our population, which is the women themselves. I totally agree. And this is such, as you said, even before, it is a business case by itself is becoming, and then you cannot avoid having 50% of the population, I mean, not empowered. I want to ask a bit uh, more. I'm sure that people are curious about what is your work at the high level? Uh, which are the policies you are trying to foster and how uh, this um, organ is trying to, to foster women empowerment? So at the high level, uh, Samuel, uh, I must tell you, number one, we um, at the UN Secretary General's high level panel, we uh, myself, along with global leadership, uh, which means the MD of IMF, Christine Lagarde, the president of World Bank, Jim Young, President Costa Rica, Minister of Tolerance, Sheikh Alubna, UAE, um, you know, Tina Fordham, Managing Director of City, 
all global dignitaries and myself somehow we were together for two years working on the global policy framework for women's economic empowerment so like what is that global policy framework that all the UN member states can adapt, which will standardize what needs to be done to empower women in the formal sector, in the informal sector, in the agriculture sector, in the business community, like a, a Bible, like complete indicator uh, benchmarking sheet that you have that any country has to translate that policy into national action. So that is what we did and all the UN member states signed up for that policy document. But in addition to that, in the country as well, in Pakistan as well, for example, the high level work that I'm doing with various governments, including the federal government and the provincial governments, is to make existing policy gender sensitive. You'll be surprised when you analyze policies, how gender insensitive or gender biased they are at times. They're not only not even acknowledging the presence of 50% of women. And saying that, okay, like, you know, this is the policy that will support our, our women folks. But most of the policies are biased, whereby they are uh, removing all rights from the women and only giving all the right, all the power, all the influence, all the control to the men. So I have been working actively with various, um, when I was a chairperson to Chief Minister Punjab's Task Force on Women's Empowerment, then to and even beyond, our work has been a lot on active policy reform. I think before we set out to create new policies, what is important is to reform the existing policies with um, you know, a more gender sensitized lens and a more gender sensitive approach. Thank you so much, Fiza. I really like the breadth of your work and the why the, the space from the UN now to the federal government, to the regional government, and then going to touch the grassroots level, the woman to be empowered with the solar charging station, becoming an entrepreneur, or the ones with the, the project in tourism that you have mentioned. That is really how the transformational journey that you are doing and the, the level of change you are bringing globally and in your country in Pakistan. And usually I want to ask now people that are saying, yes, okay, Fiza, you are now at the top level. You have been with the Secretary General, you have been with the, your government. But which are the now the points, some tips that you can share, how we, we can really break this glass ceiling and also what I can do, a normal listener of this podcast. I feel that uh, at the end of the day, the power is in the hands of the normal listener. The individual, you, me, whoever is listening to us, we have the power in our own hands. You know, like when I started my career back in the days, I was uh, a young woman who came from a conventional conservative background. I could have just met the fate that, you know, every other girl before me had in my family, which was to get married at 18 and become somebody's wife and raise a beautiful house. I was deviant in a positive way with the burning desire within me to create my own reality, to become the person that I am today. You know, make the best out of Fiza Farhan and to get the potential that Fiza Farhan deserves from a professional life, which was not only to be a mother or a, or, or, or a wife. Alhamdulillah, now I am also the professional I am while being a fantastic mother and wife. I, I would like to believe so. But... Um, it's really about the individual and the burning desire the individual has within themselves. Because without that, no government, no private sector, no policy can make you change the course of your life. So even at the high level, when we were at the UN Secretary General's high level panel, we came about with five stakeholders that the panel wanted to focus its work on. The government, the, the, the public sector, the private sector, the civil society, the academia, and the bilaterals. Even then, I sat on the table and I said, you know, what about the individual? Because for me, the individual is the most important stakeholder. If you and me want to do something, if I want to achieve something, if I want to do something, I will be the first one in my family to break all those glass ceilings. And believe me, like multiple glass ceilings were broken from getting your education uh, in another city where I did my bachelor's to being the first girl to going out for my master's to Warwick Business School without getting married, to being the youngest CEO of a microfinance bank in the country, to being the youngest advisor to the UN Secretary General's high-level panel, 
to being the youngest advisor to Chief Minister Punjab's uh, task force, so on and so forth. You keep breaking these glass ceilings only when you're fueled by that burning desire. And then everybody behind you kind of gets the room to flow through. So like all my female cousins or my female family after me followed the same path. They all went abroad for their masters, you know, because now they realize, oh, this is this can be done. It's a good thing. This is how it should be done. So for me, breaking glass ceilings, no government policy will make you break glass ceilings. No private sector intervention or initiative will make you break glass ceilings. Disruption comes from bold aspirations of an individual. And that is the only way glass ceilings are broken. So for me, the solution is the burning desire within you and you, the individual themselves first. And this is something that really even touched personally myself because it, it's really such a powerful message. You uh, what do you say? Even the quote in the master of your destiny, you are really the one that really have to push. You are absolutely, and you are only you can push your destiny. Um, no policy or intervention will get you to your destiny until you push it for yourself. So, absolutely, I, I think the most important stakeholder in this whole discussion is you yourself. And perfect, of course, the others can be enablers, they can be helpful to you, but. If there is no action and agency from you, it's very, very difficult. I really want to have ask the last drop of your wisdom on this. And then, you know, a, a final message, a, fa a, a, a small tip also for people. You know, we already said, do it yourself, work. Something really that you want to launch to us. I want to get the last drop of your wisdom and ask your final message to, to our people. Well, Samuel, the final message uh, to your to the audience, to everybody listening to us, be it a young girl, a young boy, or a mature person, whatever, would be to really live your life to the best of your potential. You know, we all have one life to live. Many of us are living the life dictated by somebody else in their professional or personal space. I always give this advice to young people because this is literally how I have designed my career and broken those glass ceilings and be been who I am and become who I am by listening to my burning desire, by listening to my inner feelings, by listening to my inner callings. So my, my advice would be to follow your heart, follow your passion, follow your burning desire because within that lies all the success. And as I said earlier, you are the only driver of your life you know so sit in the front seat drive your car take it to where you want it to go you know because believe me there's only one life to live and it flies by too soon so i think if each one of us takes this as a mission to live their life to their full potential as a household as a community as an economy there is no way we will not progress and thank you so much Fisa, for this wonderful advice and really what we are trying to do with giving our small little drops, trying to give voice to change maker like you and inspire and instill desire and the burning flame to people to really go out in the world and see things are possible, examples are there and go and change and really solve the problem, especially the problem in the social space and the sustainability space. Thank you, thank you so much FISA for your wisdom and for your this wonderful episode thank you thank you so much samuel my pleasure thank you for having me are you satisfied after this wonderful episode let's continue together our sustainability journey